Um, good evening and welcome to the Children's Services ONS meeting. It's now 7pm and I would like to start the meeting. I'm Councillor Rigby and the chair of this committee. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded for publication on the Council's website. Officers attending virtually on Microsoft Teams, please use the raise your hand option when you wish to speak and the animal note this down and let me know. Um, item one, apologies for absence. Rhiannon, have you received any apologies? Yes, I have. We've had apologies from Councillor Hartstein, who's been substituted by Councillor Green tonight, and apologies from the Parent Governor representative and the Church of England representative. Thank you. Um, item two, minutes. I move that the minutes of the Children's Services ONS Committee meeting of 14th March 2023 to be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the meeting m minutes? Councillor Muldoney. Thank you, Chair. Um, no comments on the accuracy of the minutes, but I just wanted to, I just noted that there's quite a lot of matters arising from the minutes, which may need for extra items to go onto the work programme. So can I ask that we go through that either when we come to the work programme item or at another point of your choosing, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments at all? Okay. No. The minutes are approved. Okay. Item three, items of urgent business. I haven't agreed to any items of urgent business for tonight. Item four, does anyone have any declarations of interest? Item five, um, terms of reference. Uh, may I ask Rhiannon to introduce this item, please? Thank you, Chair. So on page 15 of the agenda is the terms of reference for this committee as set out in the Constitution. The terms of reference sets out important information about what areas this committee considers and things like the quorum. This is, item is merely to draw members' attention to the terms of reference in the Constitution and what they are constitutionally required to do as members of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, are there any comments at all regarding this? Okay. Um, Councillor Muldoney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just, in terms of the terms of reference and the membership of the committee, wondering if... Um, we have, because we're supposed to have two co-opted members who are parent governors, and I know we've only got one at the moment who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, I understand. Um, but I wondered what action is being taken to recruit another member? I know we did put out an advert previously in which we had no response. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. But I can see if we can put out another advert soon. Thank you. anyone else got any comments at all? Okay. Move on to item six, which is the youth cabinet update. Um, please may I ask Molly Quincy to provide an update to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, so at May's monthly meeting, our guest speakers were from the Essex Wildlife Trust and the Riverside Community Big Local in Grays to speak more about Falcon Woods our chosen site for the next door nature program located in Grace. The Riverside Big Local site, mm, the Riverside Big Local re representative gave us an insight into the history of the site, how green space came about and, and the issues the site is currently presents. Working in partnership with Essex Wildlife Trust and the Riverside Community Big Local, we are planning a series of events to improve the function of the site with the support of the local residents. These events will include Lifka Picks and a community day to consult with local residents about the site, how they picture the de development and keep up. We are really looking forward to getting stuck into this project as it will not only improve the area for residents to enjoy, but also support nature's recovery on our doorsteps. At May's working group meeting, we continued our interactive workshops with Farrick's, local co lo with Farrick's council local plan manager. Our chosen problem to explore at this meeting was in open spaces within FARC, how they are currently used and how they could be te poten potentially improved. The current format is that we pick a problem in FARC that we think planning can solve. 
We discuss the challenges and opportunities with a focus on considering how other types of people might view the problem and then come up with potential solutions that the planning team can look at including in the emerging plan. We find the work to be quite fun and interesting as we get to be as creative as we like when exploring the problem, while also coming up with solutions and how we can improve the area. We feel like our thoughts and views on the future of the borough are being heard, listened to and included into plans that matter. Back in February, Thurrock Youth Cabinet was approached by Tonic, a research company, with an, an opportunity, to them, opportunity for them to take part in a research project. The project, commissioned by Ofcom, is about understanding more about young people's experience with online content that may promote or glamorise eating disorders, self-harm and suicide. A few members of the Youth Cabinet were involved in the co-design workshop stage of this opportunity in February, hoping to deliver, develop appropriate re research tools. More recently, a few members have taken part in the main research project through a one-to-one -one interview with a young research pra pra practitioner. These in the interviews themselves are trying to understand more about young people's experiences online. In particular, when young people see or find things online that make, that make suicide, self-harm or eating disorders look appealing, gaining an understanding of what young people think about it, how they respond and what impact it has on them. The findings of the study will be used by Ofcom to develop guidelines and policy to keep young people safe online. Youth Cabinet members are compelled to have input into, into this project to aid the work being done and safeguard young people online, which we feel is extremely important. As a thank you gesture, Tonic has made a £250 Amazon voucher to donation to the Youth Cabinet to acknowledge for their time, commitment and input into this research, which we are all extremely grateful for. In partnership with Thurrock Music Services, we, we created a Thurrock Music Survey earlier this year, which was live for a month in March 2023. We had 187 young people take part in the survey in total across the borough. We are in the process of lialising with the head of Thurrock Music Services to form a Thurrock findings report to share. And the last item on this report is the Youth Wellbeing Day update. I'm going to hand over to my fellow Youth Governor George to speak more about this. Thank you, Molly. Hello, everyone. I'm George, and I'm here to talk about the Youth Wellbeing Day, as I was part of the delivery on the day. On Wednesday, the 31st of May 2023, we had our Youth Wellbeing Day to raise awareness on the importance of wellbeing. Inspiration for the day came from a teenage mental health walk and youth cabinet that, sorry, that the Youth Cabinet ran in July last year, and also from the 2022 Make Your Mark consultation, where more than... 430,000 11 to 18 year olds voted on issues they cared about the most. Results from the cons consultation highlighted that health and wellbeing was the most important issue to more than uh, 93,000 young people nationally. We felt, that we felt that a youth wellbeing day was necessary to give for young people the knowledge and tools they need to look after their wellbeing whilst having fun and building bonds at the same time. For the event, we were able to take 20 young people and we are pleased to say that we were fully booked and the 20 young people attended. The day involved lots of fun activities such as debates on the pitfalls of social media and school pressures and the impact that these can have on mental health. We did canoeing around the lake where we stopped at different points to answer health and wellbeing questions. Afterwards we had fun in the water that all the young people loved. During the lunch break we did a, we did a health and wellbeing quiz to test young people's knowledge on the topic. After lunch we got back to nature and built a campfire and made a giant bug hotel. The day ended with young people receiving support on how to tackle or worry or problem they may be facing and tips on how to overcome similar concerns in the future. Here are some of the pictures from the activities. So getting ready for the canoe activity. Uh, fun in the lake after the canoe activity. Building friendships. Building a campfire, the giant bug hotel, and the end of day speech from a youth cabinet member thanking everyone for coming. We feel the day was a great success. We received some positive feedback from young people and their parents. Some of the feedback from young people was that they loved getting out in nature and socialising, and it made them feel good. Um, they learned so much about wellbeing and how we should look after it. 
It was a well-organised day with enjoyable activities and it was really nice meeting new people and people of different ages. Uh, feedback from the parents was that this is a quick message to say thank you for yesterday's youth wellbeing event on behalf of my daughter. We appreciate your time and effort to make such a beautiful event take place. Just a quick email to say thank you very much for the wellbeing day. Both boys enjoyed it, especially jumping in the lake after the canoe activity. Overall, overall, the youth cabinet are very pleased that the young people appreciated our efforts and acknowledged that it was a well thought out day. We feel like we achieved what we set out to achieve. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Molly and George. That was excellent. Really glad that you both seem to be concentrating on the outdoors and getting out into nature, health and the environment, and also improving mental well-being in young people. That's really good. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions or comments to make, please? I just want to thank you, you know, for engaging with different organisations and doing all these good work. So thank you. The green. Thank you, George Molly, for presenting the report. It's always um, fantastic to hear from the youth cabinet, but I would want to look back at previous minutes. You were looking at getting um, further representation from schools. I just want to know how is that going, and is there anything we can do as councillors and this committee to help you in this? Thank you. They'd like me to take that one. <laughs> so my name's Angela. I'm the Participation Engagement Officer and I lead with the Youth Cabinet on the Youth Cabinet. Um, yes, recruitment is going well, actually, from the schools. Um, I have had responses for all of them. I am engaging with some of the schools that I didn't have representation from um, and I'm looking to get them on board as soon as possible. So... Yes, hopefully we can reach our 25, which is max what we can take. So we're getting there, thanks. Councillor Pitt. Good evening. Thank you for your presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I'm glad that young people are taking more interest in the environment around them. And I was particularly interested because in Avely we have a a rec, we call it the recreation ground, and there's a, a space in, in the rec that's a bit dishevelled, you know, a bit overgrown and everything. And uh, the last two months, we've got meetings there, and we're trying to make this area, like with bug hotels, ladybird houses, you name it, hedgehogs, and it seems to waste the way it is. It's all overgrown and horrible. So I'm really glad that you're interested in the environment and keep the good work up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Michelle Lucas. Uh, thanks ever so much. A um, couple of bits from me, really. Really, really good to hear about your work with the local plan. That is absolutely crucial that young people are really involved in, in bringing that forward. We reported on that at the last ONS. I'm glad to see that still continuing. I guess my other one is an observation. Um, interesting that all young people across the country are talking about well-being. I think that's quite a shift. Historically, we've had safety. So it's interesting, isn't it, that shift to sort of well-being. And I guess it's about how we... Um, expand that opportunity we clearly can't run a lot of these events um, you know all the time however the learning that the young people got from that event how are they taking it back into their wider networks and their wider peer groups so I think it's about how we enable young people to learn more about what's going on and actually what's available so that that's my question I'd just like you to clarify the question, if that's okay. Absolutely, no problem. So you had 20 young people doing the wellbeing event. Are those young people talking to other young people about the learning they got from the wellbeing event so that we're actually expanding the opportunity so more young people are aware of the things that are available? I guess it's about making sure that we're reaching 
wider groups of young people? I guess that's the question, and that may be something you'd want to consider um, going forward. Um, I believe that some of the young people are going in back into their you know, social networks and are taking the stuff they learned on the Wellbeing Day forward. So a couple of the people were from my school, so I've, I've obviously got close contact with them. And we had such a wide group of people come that it, I think it's made an impact on a couple of different social circles that may have been without the education on mental well-being without it. Councillor Muldoon. Thank you, Chair. That's wonderful to hear. It's always wonderful to hear from the Youth Cabinet. And I must say, I'm really impressed with the range of projects that you've been doing. Um, I mean, they're all very important, but just, just to touch on the one that, that councillors haven't mentioned, um, the research project with Tonic, I think this is such important work to keep children, you know, to keep children and young people safe online. Um, and I really commend you for for the work that you're doing in that area and also the work that you've been doing with mental well-being. Absolutely fantastic. Glad that you're still here as a youth cabinet as well and that we still have you, Angela. So um, really delighted about all that and just keep up the good work. Um, I did note from the last month, from the last meeting, which was the last municipal year, I'm not sure if the um, youth cabinet composition has changed since then, has, has it? or? We've still got the same chair and vice chair. Yes, that will change from September. So um, there will be a new chair and vice chair um, elected in September. So yeah, Molly will be stepping down as vice chair. So this will be her, yes, this will be likely her last meeting. Um, okay. And then our member of youth parliament will be re-elected in March next year. Well, very well done, Molly and George, and thank you so much for coming in person to present your report, because um, I imagine it's quite nerve-wracking <laughs> to be speaking in front of all these quite serious adults, um, so I really commend you for that as well. Uh, it was mentioned at the last meeting that it might be useful for the chair and the vice chair to meet with the chair and the vice chair of scrutiny. Um, I just wanted to pick that up if... I'd, I'm not sure if that happened or if it hasn't, but um, I'm very willing to make myself available for that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, the chair would be as well. Thank you. Councillor Carter. Uh, just, uh, just wanted to jump in there. Yes, I visited the youth cabinet and um, Councillor Cockshaw was invited. Uh, sadly, he was um, on that day, he was unavailable, but um, I popped in while they were... Uh, actually just across the hall there and it was a very good experience. I just want to say thank you for all the work you have done, Molly. It was um, certainly the committee has changed so much um, th this year. It's, I think it's only Councillor Panjala who was uh, still on it from last year. So um, uh, everyone who was on it last year always spoke about how wonderful you were and it's really great to see you in person here, as um, Councillor Muldoon said. So thank you for all your work. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, I would, I'd love to welcome you actually, perhaps to a meeting when we've done our elections for our new round. I think that would be really useful for them to, to meet with you. So I'll touch base with you at some point about that um, later in the year, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great, Angela. Um, I used to actually come along when I was shadow portfolio holder before to the youth cabinet meeting. So, I mean, that's always an option as well. Just, just let me know how I can be of help. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Punjab. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just I would like to congratulate and uh, to Angela, uh, youth worker for her team, doing amazing work. I have, I have completed last one year through this uh, children's services over the scrutiny community. I enjoyed a lot. And I just I want to give a well done, the keep continue the same work because you are bringing so many innovative new projects. And I would like to give my advice, uh, like a suggestion that we need to introduce the crime prevention through the youth cabinet. And if you need any support as a counselor, I'm always ready to help you and support you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. That actually means a lot. Thank you, thank you. We are, we've got 
you know, from September moving forward, we've got some really, you know, exciting new stuff in the pipeline. So there's there's more things to kind of share with you that are, um, we've got going, haven't we, guys? So, yeah, we've got to get our heads together over the summer and, and get ready for, for September and uh, a new round of work. So I look forward to sharing with you then. Are there any further comments or questions? Okay. In that case, thank you all so much for coming in this evening and um, we look forward to meeting with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. We'll sneak out quietly. Thank you. Um, we're, now actually, we're now going to move um, to item nine, um, which is the fees and charges review of 2023 to 2024. Uh, um, is it's down as Michelle Lucas, but I think, are you introducing the report? Yes, yeah. St Stephen there, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as I'm sure members will recall, when the Council's budget was set in uh, March of this year, there were various comments made by the Commissioners uh, which noted that further action would be needed to support the Council's financial sustainability. This would result in further material changes to the budget and specifically this includes but is not restricted to a full review of fees and charges by quarter one that is by the 30th of june uh, the comments were taken on board and irrespective of that it's clearly very important that the council itself activates what it can to help and assist and put it back into a financially sustainable position equally we understand the commissioners will be writing a letter to the department uh, reporting on progress by the council and hopefully they will acknowledge this work and therefore that will be a positive statement for the council in front of the minister. The main features of the work are that this will be a three-stage process. The first stage is a policy which is enclosed, which is fully supported by the commissioners. We've begun to examine benchmarking, there is more to be done and we've undertaken some price reviews. The second stage will be further price reviews, working with colleagues across the council and the longer term activity will be to review all of the services, not just from a perspective of existing prices, but from a perspective of is that service generating as much income as it reasonably can uh, for full cost recovery. The two principal elements of the policy are that we recommend full cost recovery and a minimum increase in prices each year by CPI. The policy sets out a number of issues, as you would expect, the timetable, the basis of charging, the council's financial position, factors to be taken into account and other matters. And the paper also recommends a number of price increases in the appendices. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you for the report. Um, so yes, it's, um, obviously there are some fairly substantial increases, but um, fully understand the need for them. Um, are there any Questions or comments at this point in the meeting? Council. Thank you for presenting the report. Um, I've got a question in the inequality assessment for the Thameside Theatre. It states communities and groups who fall into a category of disability, LGBTQ, health and well-being of residents, that the increase in fees will have a negative effect. With this in mind, have you contacted the groups affected and have you looked at ways to minimise these negative effects? I'll have to ask my colleague to pick up that detail if that's okay, Councillor. Thank you. No, no problem. Apologies, Councillor. I can certainly talk about the EIA for Grange Waters, but to pick up on an EIA for one of the other areas. Um, would be difficult for me to do. I, I, I mean, I would suggest at this stage that if that is a question, perhaps we could go away and look at that, Stephen. Not a problem, my mistake. Uh, we're, we were assuming that specific committees would focus on the ones within their remit and then officer colleagues would have been here, but we can certainly take that away and get you a response on that. Yes, my apologies. Thank you. Councillor Maldoni. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question, first of all, for Stephen, if I may. So I understand there's three stages to this. My first question is the fees and charges which have been reviewed, have they been reviewed in line with the new policy? 
We have taken the inflation increase in comparison to what inflation should have been as a guide and discussed with colleagues. So it's been used as a guide uh, before formal approval of the policy. It's good practice. So yes, it's been discussed with colleagues. Okay, and um, obviously this, normally we have the fees and charges paper which came last November and fees and charges are raised from the 1st of April each year. It's highly unusual to have a second paper with more charges being raised and um, quite a few of the charges actually being raised for the second time this um, calendar, this financial year. Um, Are we're also being, are we are actually being asked to agree the, the policy at this meeting? That's another thing that I'm unclear about. Uh, scrutiny has been asked to comment on the policy and comment on the proposed price increases. We will then take all of the minutes from the various scrutiny committees back to Cabinet. I think it's the 13th of July and Cabinet will be asked to make a decision on the policy and on the price increases from the 1st of October to get the Council a half year financial benefit. Okay, because the recommendation actually asks us to agree, in particular agreeing the commitment to full cost recovery and annual CPI inflation increases as the default. So that is correct. So it's not just commenting, it's asking us to agree that? It's both. Any comments the committee makes will also be fed back through the minutes to the cabinet, yes. So um, the first concern that I've got is as this is a second paper, uh, for, uh, personally, I don't find it acceptable that we're raising fees and charges for a second time within the calendar year, within the financial year. Um, secondly, I did a sort of full analysis of the fees and charges. So, for example, the club use of site for the Newfoundland um, Dog Club. That fee was raised by 9.61% on the 1st of April. Now you're asking for an additional raise of 4.62% in October, so that's 14.23% rises altogether. Um, there was also a rise last April, so over the last two years there's been almost a 20% rise to that charge, and you know, I could go on because most of the rest of them are the same. So they're above inflation rises, I think all the ones that are being ra raised again. Um, so that's the full day charge, of the training lodge and dining cabinets and the half day charge, the celebration groups for single and double activities, um, we're seeing above inflation rises, private tuitions for all the, the different sessions, one and a half hour, three hour and four hours. And we've got an impact assessment which says that this is gonna negatively impact, it's quite clear it says that it's gonna negatively impact um, children and young people in the borough and in particular some actually you know protected groups LBGT etc so um, oh sorry that's the Thames side one but um, disabled children and children with special educational needs um, so I'm really not happy about that um, what is the justification for these above inflation rises within this financial year? Yes, certainly. But I'm sure members are aware that the council's financial position is extremely challenging and the council is going to have to do an awful lot over the next several years at every opportunity to reduce its expenditure and increase its income. So that is one reason for doing it. The second was it was a, a specific comment uh, by the commissioners that they require that to be done. So there are two reasons. One, the council's self-sustainability to allow it to continue to deliver services in the future. Secondly, to meet the instructions of the commissioners. Uh, in terms of the uh, inflation, whether it's an increase in inflation really depends as to whether the previous five years increases have equaled inflation. And what the exercise has done is go back, compare previous years increases to inflation and as a whole indicate whether that service has kept pace with inflation over that five year period. And that is what has guided increases at the moment. So they will be significant now, they may be significant in the future, but we are comparing price increases over a five year period. 
and uh, whether we fully cost recover, which is the other issue, may be something that needs to be taken account in the future. Um, I've got a question about full cost recovery because um, I'm sure you'll agree it can be quite a blunt instrument. I mean, we've just had an example recently where um, a letter went out to schools asking for £8,000 per crossing patrol um, officer. I'm not quite sure what the... I mean, we always used to call them lollipop men and lollipop ladies, so I'm not quite sure what the, what the, term, what term the council uses for them yet. Um, and it seemed like there was a lot of char there was a lot of money on top of what the base pay is really for those crossing patrol officers. Um, so my question is, how will what what checks and balances will there be, and how will you monitor this so that it doesn't go beyond full cost recovery and actually you know, the pressures of the financial situation at the council, this is what I'm concerned about, actually pushing us into charging for discretionary services and actually making a profit out of them. Certainly, councils cannot make a profit and that we will monitor, as I'm sure you're aware, and certain prices are fixed by statute, but councils can fully recover their costs. Uh, the way we will do that is by the appendix that is at the back of the policy which sets out good practice as to what costs are to be included. That gives a guide and it will be a combination of finance colleagues working with service colleagues to make sure all of those costs are appropriately allocated. And that then will go through to each cost centre and that then will feature in the third stage of the process when we will look at whether a service is fully cost recovering or not. We will also bring a specific element in each budget monitor that references fees and charges and demonstrates the members' information what activity has been undertaken, where we are on cost recovery, how the income is coming in. So you do have information that will come through to you on a regular basis. We're very clear of the statutory duties. The council cannot make a profit. Councils can make a marginal profit as long as it even out over two or three years. Uh, and we will monitor and track that for you. And the example of the, the, the crossing, um, the lollipop ladies or lollipop men, um, how did you get to a figure, of, how did we get to a figure of £8,000 per member of staff when the, when the pay is around 4300 I've seen the letter, I haven't seen the detail to yeah. be perfectly frank. I imagine there was a costing exercise done on it, I can follow it up for you if you wish me to do so. I have heard of it but it rather predates me in its preparation, but I can certainly follow up. Okay, yeah, thank you. If you could get back to us on that. I know that this is actually a P, you know, planning, transport and regeneration um, cost saving, but obviously it does impact on um, children's services um, and our local schools, in fact, who uh, now may have to find, find that money if they want to keep their um, lollipop men or ladies. Thank you. Are there any further questions, please? Councillor. Uh, thank you for your report. Just on page 51, uh, on these identifying additional new charges. So, on these bus suspension charges, it was previously kept at two days, 350. But now this is monthly 300 mand. I understand a longer term, if it's months worth of work, then you will get extra money. But then on the other hand, underneath on visitor parking, you are proposing to take away 100, per 100 hours of free parking visitors. So is there any way you can amend this, the first one, where we can, like there are potentially, you can increase this by giving some at least 10 or 20 hours to these uh, visitors parking hours. So maybe it can mitigate the overall amount. Uh, three proposals that colleagues identified as we were going down doing the exercise on the specifics uh, and colleagues in services have suggested that we can increase the prices and indicated uh, and I think what you'll find in the future is people will also initiate new ideas as we go around the exercise so that is the plan behind these that they are options for cabinet to consider in July no feedback comments thank you Anyone else got any further questions?
Councillor Mulder. Hello. Yeah, I did have one further question specifically about the um, Grange water charges. Um, so if we look at the equalities impact assessment for that, um, there's obviously, I think, one neutral impact. All the rest are negative impacts. Um, but we're still going ahead with these charge increases. Can you explain that? And what measures are being taken to lessen any impacts? So um, looking at the um, EIA, um, what we are looking at is in ways we can mitigate that. So um, we've got a number of um, fully funded programs for um, families that may find it a struggle. You'll be very well aware we've reported to committee um, on a couple of occasions actually around the holiday activities programs um, and we've made sure that there's programs available for children and young people with special educational needs. So we're trying to mitigate as much as possible where residents might struggle uh, to um, find the money for the price increase. What I would say is that we did some market testing uh, we looked at what other centres are charging, as you'd expect us to, um, and we feel that, you know, those are charges that we can put forward at this stage, recognising uh, the position uh, that the council finds itself in. We will continue to monitor that. Um, we will continue to ensure that those of uh, our vulnerable children and young people are able to access um, sort of provision um, over at the site. And where possible, we're looking to identify external funding, which may be able to support that further. So it's about how we grow opportunities funded externally, so other funding coming in to the site to enable those um, vulnerable uh, children and young people to access the provision. Thank you. If I might have one follow-up question. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you for your answer, Michelle. Um, I mean, I appreciate the financial situation. However, I think we can all agree that the children of the borough are not in any way responsible for the present financial situation of the council. And personally, I find it very distasteful that they are having to pay for it. Um, in terms of external funding, what, what sources of external funding are you pursuing, please? So we've got some central government funding, which is the holiday activities programs. So they'll be in all over the summer and offer um, opportunities um, in school holidays. We've also uh, managed to secure some funding uh, from some other smaller charitable trusts, actually in many respects to support us with replacement of equipment so that we've got the right equipment um, sort of on the site. But we continue to look at ways in which we can generate income or get external funding. Um, again, if there's anything that committee can suggest, um, I'm very open to anybody coming to have a conversation with me if there's things they feel there's things we can tap into. Um, but clearly we have got a range of things on offer um, you know, over the holiday periods. So there is funding presently for the holiday activities programme that's already in place, that's good. Um, there is some funding, smaller funding for replacement of equipment, which is obviously important, but um, uh, there are no other external sources of funding that you're currently looking into. We're currently exploring a number of things. Um, we're, we're always looking for ways in which we can generate income onto the site, and that's how it operates. So we will be looking closely to see what else might be available. And um, I repeat the, the, the ask again, if anybody's got any suggestions, then I'm more than happy to have conversations with colleagues on committee. I'd welcome that, actually, because there may be ways in which, you know, we can tap in. One of the things I've been keen to consider is local business, of course, to see if there's any opportunity there. So if there's ways uh, colleagues would like to work with me on that, I'd be very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'll just add in quickly on that, if that's okay, Councillor Panjali. Um, yes, I think um, that is a, a good idea, looking at businesses, even perhaps things like advertising, um, you know, asking local businesses if they want any advertising space, those sort of avenues. Um, you talked about fully funded programmes and trying to get external capital. Will there be a discount scheme in place as well for sort of certain age groups or in lower income families or will there unlikely to be a sort of set discount? How do you think it will work like that? It's very difficult when we try and introduce discounts because actually then it's about asking for information about people's personal circumstances, which is, isn't always very easy. So what we do go with the Holiday Activities Programme, that's for families who are accessing free school meals, but it's also for families that have got children with SCND. So we've got some discretion around that, which is really useful because it's enabled us to provide a range of programmes for our special educational needs, um, young people. I think we're always open to consider a whole range of things. It's about what processes we'd need to put in place to enable that to happen. But again, something to consider when we're doing that review. Thank you. Councillor Panjala. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the report uh, regarding this uh, fees and charges, page number 47. Benchmarking data is a comparison report showing the happy to see the Tarak having the less fees and charges compared to other boroughs. So do we have the like uh, same comparison report how the Tarak resident uh, like a common basic man uh, income, how much they're earning compared to other boroughs? Uh, we don't have, this is initial work, literally over a matter of a few weeks, we don't have the income comparison yet, but what it does seem to indicate is that the council has an opportunity to look at other services and possibly charge more for those and we can get the financial data in the longer term. So it's initial go at benchmarking and it's a, an indicator as benchmarking often is and we will follow it up and there'll be a lot more benchmarking to do in the coming year or so. Thank you. The reason why I'm asking because we need to see how the affordable for the Tarak resident. So about these charges increase, so whether they are capable or not, because already there are a lot of burden, inflation is going high and cost of living. So every level, you know, in, prices are increasing, cost of cost is increasing, but income is not increasing at the same ratio. So it is, is impacting the poor families you know, severely, so we need to look into into that one as per from my, my point of view. So I have a one more query regarding the page number 68. Uh, if we see the fees and charges, 2% uh, two, two to like maximum, it went up to 27 percentage. So, in, in on street car parking for the permit for NHS permits and the parking permits for non commuter car parking permits is about 25 percentage. Is there any a reason why we increasing too much compared to other charges? Again, this goes back to the exercise of comparing how much prices have increased in the last five years. So purely by way of example, not specifically car parking, if something hasn't increased for four years, it will see a much bigger percentage increase to catch up in the fifth year. Uh, equally, if something has been increasing at inflation, you won't see an increase. Uh, and that's what we've done. So some will be more, some will be less, but it's a catch up exercise using the last five years as an, in, as an example. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mulder. Thank you. I mean, I know because I was chair of the committee the previous, not last year, but the previous year, I remember that when the um, price charges came through that we had massive above inflation charges then, when inflation was around 4%, um, some really high, up to 60%. Um, and before that, we've had historically low inflation. So um, I, I understand that you're saying to me that these price jumps that we're getting for the second time um, this year, which add up to above inflation charges are, there's been some kind of calculation taking the last five years into account. Um, 
but it, it <laughs> well, I'd like to see the working out on that anyway. Um, if I can come back to my children's services colleagues. So I just wanted to ask, I can see that the negative impact on those with a disability, you're gonna be looking at the holiday activities program and um, looking at how to advertise that to families who've got a child with a disability, which I welcome. Um, but in terms of race and the impact on um, our families and children in terms of race, is there any specific external funding that you're going for that would help out these families? Not currently, Councillor Muldoney. As I said, it's, it's something that we are actively pursuing. Um, clearly, uh, the Holiday Activities Programme is open to all uh, sort of children and young people across the borough. Um, so regardless of you know, whether they've got a disability or what race and so forth. So there is, um, that's available, that's, that's, a, that's available to all families. But I think there is something about how we look at some targeted approaches going forward. Um, I think what we need to think about is where are those opportunities for us to secure more income, to support more families, to be able to utilise the facilities at Grange Waters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening to present the report. Okay, we'll now move on to item seven. Um, which is the Sorry, can we just do the recommendations quickly? Oh. So we have the recommendations, 1.1 um, is that Children's Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the proposed fees and charges policy, Appendix 1, in particular agreeing the commitment to full cost recovery and annual CPI inflation increases as the default. Uh, um, I, I don't agree with part of that recommendation. Okay. Um. This is to note, uh, if you are proposing something, then you need to propose something. Sorry, well, Councillor no Adams, are you the chair? So, um, we're noting, um, but also agreeing, I think, isn't it, in the terms, if I can. It, it, it literally says, committee, note the proposal. And if, if uh, the councillor want to make a proposal, then she needs to propose something, and then we can agree or can disagree? Uh, I'm not prepared to agree to the commitment to full cost recovery and annual CPI inflation increases. And if I had a choice of whether I was going to agree with the um, charges, which isn't actually part of the recommendation, uh, I wouldn't be agreeing with that either. That's fine, Councillor Maldoni, I've noted that um, the minutes will be um, added to the Cabinet paper and so your comments will be viewed by Cabinet on that evening. Thank you. Have any other members um, to note any disagreements or is others in, ag in agreement for the I just wish to second what um, Councillor Maldoni said. Okay. Any... Okay. Into disagreement. So you'll note those. Yes, so I'll note that Councillor Green and Councillor Panjala also um, don't agree and agree with Councillor Maldoni's comments. Okay, so the other members are in agreement um, with recommendation 1.1. Okay, so recommendation 1.2. That Children's Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the proposed fees and charges increases for the material areas, Appendix 2. Noted? Yep, all noted. Okay. Thank you. So we will now move on to item 7. Apologies for Ms. Earlier. The progress. Sorry, there's two more recommendations 1.3 and 1.4. 1.3, that Children's Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the proposed new change charges in section 8 of this report. Noted. 
that Children's Overview Recommendation 1.4, that Children's Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the requirement for further detailed review and analysis of remaining fees and charges by quarter four, 2023-2024. Thank you. Okay, so moving now on to item seven, the progress update from Thurrock Local Safeguarding Children Partnership. May I ask Priscilla, Bruce and Anne to introduce this item, please. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, the report that you have in your bundle um, outlines the progress on the work to date um, made by Thurrock LSCP and action plan that we have currently. Um, following a review of the pathway to service threshold intervention document by a multi-agency task and finish group, we relaunched um, the threshold intervention document and published that on our website. Um, following the publication, we held um, a launch event that brought together all practitioners that would be interested and would use this guide. And it was quite a well attended um, session. We had presentations from various um, multi-agency um, services, such as the multi-agency safeguarding hub, the Think Family Service, and the virtual school, amongst some others. Um, feedback from the sessions were really good, and we're still having um, people come to us to talk about what else we could be doing um, around the threshold document. Um, in addition to the three days that we um, held the walk online road shows in November, we picked up another three days in March, just gone, and invited 2,300 children from year seven and eight um, from all Thurrock secondary schools to experience the walk online road show. Now, these walk online road shows are really vital because they cover risks online and um, emerging um, challenges that children are, f are facing online and we give an interactive and balanced approach to the learning which the children found quite um, productive, quite informative and they were really engaged. Um, feedback following those sessions from both children um, and teachers were really good um, and they teachers definitely recommended that we picked up the children coming in September um, this year. Um, we complement those roadshows with um, a parent, carer and um, professionals specific um, roadshow that's held virtually um, following the walk, show, walk online roadshows just so that we've got the information that we've given to the children to those adults so that they can best support those children with the information that they receive at those workshops. Um, as part of the neglect strategy, the subgroup devised a neglect toolkit and screening tool um, to be used by practitioners, and this was launched at our um, neglect conference that was held in April this year. It was a face-to-face -face conferen conference and picked up on one of the um, priorities for the local safeguarding partnership, which is neglect, which is a huge priority for us, which we're doing lots of work on. Um, the event was opened by Dr. Prakash Srivastava, creator of the Neglect Graded Care Profile Assessment Tool. He did quite an in-depth um, opening speech to practitioners that came from across the partnership. We then had um, some workshops that um, practitioners were able to attend, and this covered a range of topics that you'll see in my report. Um, we have in the local Safeguarding Children's Partnership a program of um, multi-agency uh, audits. So we dip sample some case audits by theme and we look at what's up if there's any learning to be had and if there's any development work to be done. And so for those, for the period up until now, we looked at pe young people transitioning from children's to adult services and we also looked at um, statutory audits um, looked after children, children in need, and child protection cases. Um, any learning outcomes from those audits are discussed and actions are placed against them that we then work on across the multi-agency um, task workforce. Um, we have in enhanced our learning and development program, um, specifically with topics that we've picked up from training that's been already delivered, from case audits, from national audits, from national learning, and from ad hoc conversations across the multi-agency workforce. And so recently we've added training and development on Think Family, working with families who are uncertain, neglect being one of our priorities, and professional curiosity. 
we have um, one case review action plan that we are progressing at the moment, and this is on the thematic review into serious youth violence and gang-related crime. I'm pleased to say that of the six recommendations that are divided into five, at 15 actionable areas, four are rated green and 11 are amber. All actions um, within the document are progressing to timescales, and we aren't worried about any of them slipping behind at the moment. And that completes my presentation. Thank you very much for that report. Um, particularly good to see all the work you're doing online because that is such a big area now for, for youngsters coming through. They do can live their lives throughout the internet, so that's very good. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from members, please? Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. In um, section 3.1, can you please go into further action points R? And with these actions, could you please help put the residents and visitors at ease who visit the Chafford 100 station and Lakeside that these actions will tackle the youth-related violence being experienced in recent months? Thank you. In terms of the action plan for this youth violence, um, this was in relation to an incident that happened within the Black Shots area, and so that thematic review covered some of those instances there. There are some actions within the um, action plan, which I don't have in front of me, but the governance group see, and they um, monitor and progress them through the governance structure. However, there are some actions within those, um, there are some actions within the recommendations of that action plan that pick up some um, work to do work with schools so work with children that may be at risk w um, work with children that have um, I suppose questionable behavior within schools there's some project work that's been done and shared with one secondary school that's been shared with a lot of primary schools to reduce the risk of um, exclusion in schools as well so there are lots of bits of project work that's been done to minimize the risk to children that are coming through the system and that may be at risk so they've been identified earlier would that be across Thurrock or in only in, in certain areas? No, across Thurrock. These okay. are across Thurrock schools. Okay, thank you. Councillor Elba. Uh, thank you for your report and thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, uh, thank you, you know, obviously it's very important to support our children and young people who are disadvantaged, you know. So thank you for all your good work. At 2.2, you did say you have invited around 2,300 children in year seven and eight. So can you please give us numbers, how many of these have attended? So we invited 2,300 children and we only had a drop of rate of a couple. There were all the, all the um, schools responded with their numbers of children in their cohorts. And of, on the day, if some of the children were either unwell or not able to attend school, then they didn't come to the, ro the roadshow. But by and large, I would say the vast majority came. We had single figures that weren't able to come to school. And so because they couldn't come to school, didn't attend the workshops. Councillor Muldoon. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. It's nice to hear the ongoing work. Obviously, the action, some of the action plans I do know about um, from my previous year um, as chair and shadow portfolio holder. What, what I just would like to suggest when you bring the report, and I know we've discussed this offline, um, is that the action plans, the RAG rated action plans should, should be included in an appendix because it's very difficult otherwise, especially for new members of the committee, to really be able to see why you're doing that activity and which action plan it relates to. Um, it would really, really help us in scrutiny terms if, if you were able to um, attach those in the appendix to the next update. But thank you very much for the update, Priscilla. Thank you. Are there any further questions from members? Okay, thank you very much again. So we have, we can have a look at recommendation 1.1 on page 20, um, that the committee note the update work of the LSCP and the progress made on action plans to date. Noted? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. So we'll now move to 
item eight, which is the Children's Social Care Performance Quarter 2022 to 2023. Uh, may I ask Janet Simon to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this report is a report of the performance in children's social care across the year 2022 to 2023 and um, reports on the last quarter of the year and what our data has been. Um, so it talks about, so we start off at the front door and we talk about the amount of referrals that are coming into the system um, and whether or not these have risen or gone down. So between January and March 2023, our referrals were similar to the previous year at the, in the same period. Um, in terms of children and families assessments, there were a number of assessments completed in timescale. 99% of our assessments were completed in timescale. This was an improvement on the previous year when there were 93.1 um, during the same period. So that's evidence of improving performance. The number of children subject to a uh, child protection plan has remained relatively stable. Um, 107 compared to 110 the previous year. Um, so we review our child protection plans really closely. As well as kind of having reviews of those plans with families, we also um, have surgeries. We also do audits of those cases to make sure that they really are at the right um, threshold. Um, so in quarter four, the number of child protection episodes started was 43 compared to the same period of the pre previous year. Um, um, so although there's a significant, this is um, the numbers of episodes ending was 26 compared to the previous year. Um, this doesn't present a concern as the numbers are expected to fluctuate up and down, but it usually means that the numbers stay steady in terms of how many children are on a plan. Um, what we've seen in children's social care is the numbers of children step down to early help um, is, um, was 66 step down compared to 108 in the previous year, but we know that the numbers within early help are staying fairly steady. Um, the multi-agency safeguarding hub, where most of our, where our referrals come in, continues to support um, a shared understanding and management of thresholds and decisions. Um, performance continues to be monitored on a monthly basis. Um, we, make, we have multi-agency um, audit groups and some of that's um, monitored through the LSCP. LSCP. Um, this report, as I said, is to kind of help you have a look at what work we're doing. So if you go further down, you can see we go through, after talking about referrals and contacts, we, next, we talk about children and family assessments, and then we talk about the numbers of children who are looked after. So our numbers of children looked after, um, it can fluctuate a bit, but it's been fairly steady. So there were 292 at the end of March, um, in line with a similar figure the year before, but a greater proportion of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and a lower entry of children in care from the resident population, um, which as reflects the trend um, seen previously. But as you can see further down, our rate of looked after children for 10,000 of population in comparison to statistical neighbors and national average, we're slightly below. So our performance is quite good in that area. And some of that's about the work we're doing around keeping children in families where it's safe to do so, where we can possibly return children home, um, then we try and do that. But of course it has to be safe. As I've noted, the numbers of unaccompanied asylum seekers has gone up. Um, so each local authority has a percentage of local uh, children that they have to take as part of their proportion. It used to be 0.07, which was 28, and that's gone up to 0.1, and that's for every local authority. A third, that means that our, the amount of children we can have as unaccompanied asylum seekers has gone up to 44. On the 30, um, 31st of May this year, there were 38 young people who were UAS. Um, this is lower than our quota of 44. At the end of the financial year, we were at 45. Um, we expect to receive, tra we, we kind of expect to receive transfers in and out. Um, sometimes we will get referrals that come in direct because we're a receiving authority as a port authority. But if we're not at our numbers and children come in through other routes, then they will be transferred into Thurrock when we are part of the, on the ROTA scheme. So there's a graph there about the amounts of children open who you ask over the period of time. There's a, uh, some information there about children who go missing and the numbers of children go missing. 
And then some information about return home interviews. This is an area of focus for children's social care. Um, we've massively, in, I think we've improved our performance around return home interviews for children quite significantly. Um, we've now reached 100% um, at the end of the children who are offered a return home interview with 72% of children across the whole year accepting and receiving an interview compared to 56% in the previous year. Um, going down to the numbers of children who um, are reviews, are looked after children reviews and are lack reviews, what we can see is that the performance is pretty good in that area. In terms, of thing, in terms of reviews happening in time scale, um, our care leaving service, um, there's a graph showing the numbers of care leavers we have and the ages. Um, for, we work with all young people age 16 plus um, who, are, who reach the criteria to, be, to receive a care leaving service. That means they have to be in care for 13 weeks or more um, past their 16th birthday. They're each um, allocated a personal advisor who's there to support them and advocate for them and support them into transitions into adulthood. We work with young people up to the age of 25 if they want our assistance, but always up to the age of 21. Um, but we offer a service to those young people who, who, who want a service post 21 as well to kind of make sure that they're kind of meeting their, their milestones. And some of that's about, it might be around specific areas. So it might be a young person, for example, who's 22. They might be going to university and they need additional support around accommodation and managing some of that. There's a breakdown of care leavers and the ages of care leavers and the genders that's something that's been asked for in the past. We tend to have more males than females and some of that's related to um, our unaccompanied asylum seeking young people. Um, because the majority of them are male. So we have very few unaccompanied asylum seekers who are female. It's usually one or two. Um, in terms of our performance about, around education, employment and training, this is an area that we are aware needs to have some further focus um, in terms of raising those numbers. We, would, we want to be ambitious in terms of how many, children, how many of our young people are in employment, education and training. This is an area that we think as a council um, we should be supporting and there's conversations within corporate parenting and some work to be done I think with members but also within directorates about how we can support our young people as parents. Um, in terms of suitable accommodation, at the end of March um, 2023, 87% of our young people were in suitable accommodation. Those numbers can be affected um, for various reasons. Um, so unsuitable accommodation includes um, care leavers who are in prison. If you're in prison, then that's considered to be unsuitable accommodation. It might be care leavers who've returned home who we don't think is suitable accommodation. It might be that we do not know where they're living because they won't tell us. And we have a small number of unaccompanied asylum seeking um, care leavers who we don't, who have not kept in touch with us and who, whose whereabouts we're un unaware of. Um, in terms of adoption, at the end, uh, in 2023, 2022, 23, 14 children were adopted. Um, four are currently matched with prospective adopters. Um, our, our performance in that area has improved. So pre-COVID, our performance was around 12 children per year during the COVID year and the following years. So the last two years, our performance has been around half of that. So seven or eight young people, young children adopted. So we've managed to raise that figure. And some of that's about delays in court, which continue following the COVID pandemic. There's been a quite a delay. Um, and that's affected things like our timeliness in terms of adoption and proceedings concluding. One of, our, one of the areas for us is around um, placement sufficiency. That's a big area for all local authorities at the moment in terms of the ability to make sure that there's local placements for children, so that children can be placed in Thurrock or near Thurrock, so that they're near their, their families. Um, we are really mindful that we want to increase the amount of foster carers that we have, but we also need to have local provision for children who can't be in foster placements but need to be in residential. So we've worked um, quite hard to look at alternative solutions um, and to make sure that young people are in registered um, provision in Thurrock and we've worked quite closely 
um, with partners and um, other agencies, with housing in particular, to identify properties and to get provisions registered for our children. And that's sort of a summary of my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. So overall, it's a really great performance, and that's excellent to see. Um, a few of the areas um, which are slightly falling behind you sort of noted on yourself um, with the employment or education of care leavers, but you're looking at ways to try and increase those. Um, one thing I looked at with the return home interviews for missing children, is there a reason why they're sort of offered rather than sort of compulsory? Is that sort of a, a set policy, a national policy? So ideally, we'd like 100% of all of our children to be seen and spoken to after they return when they're missing. Um, we always offer an interview to young people, but sometimes they refuse. We have some young people who maybe have been missing more than once, and so they might have spoken to us, us the first time, but don't want to speak to us the second and third time. Um, missing can include a range of things, from a young person being late home, um, to a young person being missing overnight. And so it's very difficult to make that compulsory, to, to make young people talk to us if they don't want to. But we try and use different methods. So if they won't speak to the return home service, then the social worker might speak to them. We try and find somebody who knows the young person. And um, the police have recently launched um, um, something new to look at how they can engage young people. So even sometimes when they don't get to speak to us, they have been spoken to by the police. Thank you. And just another um, quick point regarding um, the unsuitable accommodation for care leavers. And you, you noted um, prisons there. Is there a statistical difference in the number of young people in prison that are care leavers as opposed to um, young people that aren't in care? I'm not entirely sure about that. So, and we know that our young, peop um, young people who are leaving care um, are more likely to be homeless um, in the future, not necessarily when we're working with them. Um, there is more likelihood that they may end up um, in prison. What we do is we try and do a lot of work in our youth offending service and through our youth crime governance board um, to make sure that we divert young people away from um, prison and from those sort of statutory services and from the courts. So we have a, an out of court disposal um, where we will look at young people who are in the care system to consider or not whether or not we can divert them, working closely with the police and the, to try and keep children out of those sorts of areas. So we do really try our best, but yes, sometimes it can happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would members like to ask any questions, please? Uh, Council Group. Thank, <coughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, the child protection episodes are now currently 26 compared to 49, a 50% increase. Can you assure this committee it's not due to um, less provisions of the service? So that is that about the child protection episodes starting? Yeah, we're at it said here we're currently at 26 compared to 49. So I just need to go back. What page is that, please? It's page 25. In the executive summary at the bottom. Sorry, two seconds. No worry. So our, our child protection numbers have remained fairly stable. Um, so what happens is you can have, so you could have, I don't know, five child protection conferences if this month where children become subject to a plan. And sometimes numbers can be affected by numbers of children in a family, for example. So, for example, today we've had five children that have come to the attention of children's social care, Yesterday, we had a family of seven. So, you know, you could have five sets of children coming into, coming onto a child protection plan. And that five sets of children could be just five individuals, or it could be five families with three children in each family. So that can hugely impact on the numbers. Like I said, we have child protection surgeries. All children on a plan are reviewed. 
Um, we have a multi-agency multi safeguarding um, audits to make sure that our threshold is applied correctly. We measure our performance monthly. Um, all children um, that, are, that are on a child protection plan are seen every fortnight, every two weeks, sometimes more often. Um, there's a whole range of things that happens within the service to make sure that our threshold is absolutely right and that if children need a statutory service and if they need to be subject to a plan, they will. That wouldn't be affected by finances. Um, our assessments are based on need. Thank you. Is it okay if I answer? Thank you. Um, we've also seen a fantastic um, foster carers campaign. How has that gone? Have we seen a, a big uptake? I think fostering right now nationally is a real issue in terms of um, recruiting. Um, so there has been a review about how we recruit foster carers and there is, um, at the moment, there's some work, work going on in the northwest that's funded by the DfE to look at how we can increase fostering um, across the country. Um, in Thorock, yes, we've got a really good campaign. We're really trying hard. I know Councillor Carter has been quite a big support around fostering. Um, our numbers of, of recruitments, um, at the moment, I think we recruited seven in year, seven households. So that can, you know, that can mean they can take one child, but it could also mean they can take three children. Um, I wouldn't say it's hugely successful, but we are working really hard with our comms team. We've renewed our um, strategy and we're doing everything we can really to try and improve the amount of foster carers that we have working for children, working in Thurrock and living in Thurrock or in the surrounding areas that can look after our children. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, could it cut start us off? Councillor Mulvaney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I want to say well done on the return home interviews because I know we've discussed them at length um, in previous meetings. Um, so it's great to see those numbers coming up. Is, can I ask, is that, is that the numbers that are actually attending the return home interviews with um, It's Inspire, isn't it? Or are you, have you just got better at capturing the other data when the police have those return home, you know, do the return home interview or social worker might check in with them? Um, so when the police speak to children, we don't capture that as a return home interview because it's a slightly different activity. Um, so Inspire were delivering our return home interviews and have been up until the end of March. Um, but we've been monitoring those really closely. So every, every week on a Monday we meet with um, the team to look at return home interviews, to find out if there's any reason why a return home interview hasn't happened. Um, we're kind of looking at those young people and trying to establish who is the best person to speak with them. Um, so sometimes it's somebody in a different service who they've got a relationship with. Um, so we've, we've brought the service back in-house and we're just um, constantly reviewing it, updating it and making sure that we're absolutely using the right people. You know, if they've got a relationship with somebody, it makes sense to try and build that relationship and to kind of get that better and to, to be better at it. Um, we had a recent audit on return home interviews, which was 80% good. Um, the next thing we're looking at is may not just having a lot of return home interviews, but looking at the quality of those return home interviews in terms of the recordings of them, but also to make sure that we're able to use the information that we get from return home interviews to hopefully reduce the amount of children going missing. Thank you. And I just wanted to sort of look at the, the um, EAT figures, the, the I looked after children that are not in or are in employment, education and training. So it's about 50%, isn't it, that are and 50% that aren't. Um, obviously, as councillors, we're all corporate parents. So it is an area which is a, is a bit of a cause for concern. Um, I understand, you know, the challenges that, are, that there have been. And obviously, in the past, before COVID, we, I think we were doing rather better than we are at the moment. Um, so I'm just wondering what actions are you taking to bring those numbers up? So there are regular meetings. So that we have a regular um, meeting that's chaired by our strategic lead. Um, they work very closely with Inspire. 
um, to kind of look at all the options that are available, to sort of look at what are the, what are the things that are stopping young people going into employment and, tra and training. We're looking at whether or not we can get young people on apprentice apprenticeships, um, and trying to be creative. Um, you know, we know that a greater proportion of children who are, who've been in the care system are likely to be, you know, in terms of, if you're looking at the general population, they don't do as well. Um, we're, we're not massively behind other local authorities, but previously we were ahead of local authorities in terms of our employment, um, education, employment and training. So we, we, wherever we can, we encourage young people to stay on in education. Um, and we do have a bit of a plea to our members about, you know, anything they're involved with. I mean, one of the things I think we need to consider is in some local authorities, they look at where they're commissioning services or where they're employing companies to do work for them, that trying to kind of get apprenticeships through those organisations. I know Michelle's service does quite a lot of the work around employability, so I don't know if Michelle's able to offer any more on that. Want me to cut up? I mean, it is a key issue, uh, particularly around apprenticeships, to be honest, that that's been a real struggle and a real challenge for us. I think what we're trying to do is to widen uh, the scope of employers that we're talking to locally and looking at ways in which we can actively engage. But I have to say, for, for many of our young people, they're just not ready for that yet. So it's about what we're doing pre that, it's about the pre-work we do, so pre-apprenticeship programmes, to look at getting them ready to take that next step um, onto an apprenticeship. Um, it, it's mirrored in our special educational needs as well. So as well as our care leavers, our SEND um, sort of young people are struggling around uh, maintaining um, apprenticeships. So we're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, um, supported internships, which is the pre-work to get them ready to go into apprenticeship opportunities. But it, it does remain, it, it's a national challenge as well as a local challenge currently. What's the issue with apprenticeships, um, Michelle? There's just why why is why aren't there so many apprenticeships? I, I think I think for many employers, um, they're not they're, they've not got back to the position they were pre-COVID. So I think for many employers, and and the thing about apprenticeships is you have to put a lot of work into them. You know, it's it's not something you know you do have to have, you have to have the staff that can support the apprentice in their opportunity. So there's a whole raft of work that needs to go around that. So I think for some employers, that's still really quite difficult and they're struggling to get to the point where they're back to that stage of um, undertaking the, uh, the apprenticeship programmes. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Councillor Abbas? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your report. You know, I think it's positive to see like, you know, some improvements in various areas. And obviously, you know, as you mentioned, we need to still kind of improve in various. So my concern is at 7.3, you know, obviously 20 miles radius, it doesn't look too far, you know, but looking into kind of travel connections or transport links, you know, into Tharak, I think 20 miles is far, you know. So are there any particularly measures you are taking to minimize this or reduce the numbers? So we, we would always want children to be placed as close to family as possible. And, you know, so they're, if they're attending school, if they're school-aged children, we want them to be near their school so that they can maintain their relationships. So obviously we're trying to attract foster carers um, who will become local authority foster carers for Thurrock, um, who live locally. So that's one of the things we want to do. The other thing we're trying to do is um, look at kind of creating residential placements within Thurrock, and we've been successful um, in creating two residential placements for children in Thurrock, and we're looking at further opportunities to do that. So, you know, we're always open to ideas around recruitment of foster carers or any ideas um, that are available, but it is really about, you know, where the placement's sometimes available. And for some children, um, they may need a specialist provision which isn't available within Thurrock, and so they may be placed further away, especially children who are in residential care. Um, so we, we, we're always welcome um, ideas, but it's around recruiting foster carers and having placements in the area. Thank you. Councillor Kanjala. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report and the progress what you are doing is happy to know that one. Uh, my query is for the previous meeting, we came to know that one, there were 40 agency uh, staff uh, care workers working in children's uh, uh, social care. So currently, how many agency staff are working? And also, how many permanent staff we have care workers directly? So in terms of, you're talking about qualified social workers? Yes. Yeah, so we have currently in children's social care uh, 50 agency workers across the service. Mm -hmm. um, recruitment of social workers is an issue nationally again. Um, there's work going on nationally around um, reducing the amount of agency workers that each local authority has, sort of making um, certain conditions around being an agency worker. We're We've got a recruitment um, and retention board where we look at the issues around recruitment. Um, we've been quite successful in some of our recruitment. So as of today, I think in terms of our management structure, we only have one manager vacancy, one team manager vacancy. We've recently um, recruited a number of newly qualified social workers who will be joining our service towards the end of the summer, August, September, when they complete their courses that will kind of reduce into, I think we've got nine or 10 new, newly qualified social workers starting, and we've got six about to start. So that will kind of reduce our agency numbers down. So we want to have a rolling program in terms of recruiting and growing our own, because we think that's a good way forward in trying to find a different way to recruit. Um, so we look at our terms and conditions. Um, we support our social workers really closely. Mm -hmm. um, they have manageable caseloads. So we're trying to find, make sure that the conditions for social workers are good. The work is hard um, and agency social work can sometimes be attractive to social workers. Um, but we want people to be permanent and to be, build relationships with our children. So yes, that's where so we are currently. Uh, is it possible to give the breakdown like a permanent direct recruitment uh, from the like uh, social qualified care workers, not depending on the, like, uh, not from the agency, direct recruitment, how many currently we are working in the... So you want to know how many social workers currently yeah, work in children's social care? Not from the agency, direct recruitment. Apart from the agency workers. Hang on a minute, yeah. I can probably tell you that quite easily. So most, the majority of our social workers are permanent. Permanent direct recruitment. Direct Not recruit. through agency. Not through agency. The majority of our social workers are permanent. But I can provide that breakdown um, to committee after this. I don't have the exact numbers on me, so I don't want to make it up. No problem. You take your own time. And <laughs> just I want to make sure that like, uh, direct permanent and the uh, agency, what is the pay gap difference? Can we know that one? Okay, so there is a, a difference in terms of um, what we pay permanent workers and what we pay agency workers. Yeah. But the net difference is not huge because mm -hmm. um, with permanent workers, there are on costs such as pension and national insurance and other contributions. I don't have those figures available to me today in terms of the mm -hmm. difference and what that costs. Can we able to get for a next meeting or? <laughs> um. We've worked with our HR department on looking at what is the difference, but we, we calculate it from social workers, including mm -hmm. on costs. So our social workers might not get that pay in their hand, but the council has to, it's around about 20% of, of the salary then is on costs for, so we compare what we pay as a local authority in total for a social worker mm -hmm. to what we pay for an agency worker. And I think the last time we looked at that, the difference is in the region of 10K better if you're if for agency workers um, that the council has to pay. But as I say, the agency workers then are responsible for their own on costs. So if they want to have a pension, they have to pay that out of the money that's paid to them. If they're on sick leave, they pay for their own sick leave. If they want to take annual leave, we don't pay for that as a council, mm. but for our permanent staff, we pay for all of that, which mm. is part of the on costs that we have to pay for those roles. So it means uh, recruiting through agency, we can save like uh, much money than recruiting directly. So Sorry, recruiting through the agency, we can minimize the cost. 
compared to recruiting directly? So, yeah. so, so the, the cost that we would save is roughly the 10K extra, um, because obviously we would still be paying for permanent staff. So, so the, the, the cost to the council is roughly around about 10K per um, social worker. It mm -hmm. changes as you, go, as you go up the system in terms of what the costs are. Mm -hmm. um, but as Janet said, we've been very successful in our recruitment permanently for all the posts from team manager. And we've got about, is it 30? 30 odd team managers across the service and we've only got one vacancy then all of our service manager roles are permanent all our strategic lead roles are permanent Janet's permanent I'm permanent so once you move from team manager up it's it's you know we were practically permanent bar one team manager where we struggle like every other council is with your more experienced social workers so we can recruit and we do recruit newly qualified social workers and we have quite a few students in our service so we're looking to the future all the time you know people get attached to where they are a student and generally want to work permanently there so getting newly qualified is not so much of an issue it's trying to attract those social workers who've got some experience and and that's where and it is a national issue and it's part of the care review there was a whole exercise on how do we recruit into the social work profession and manage to hold people within the profession? So there's been a whole national agenda on that. And we've actually worked as an Eastern region on a microsite mm -hmm. for social work across the whole region. So you can go on the microsite and you can have a look at um, what it's like to be a social worker in Thurrock or Bedford or Cambridge. or And, and it's, it's, it's about trying to attract people into social work um, profession. We hope they'll all choose to be in Thorak when they look at that website. Uh, well, I have one more thing. When it comes to the national issue, like from through the local government, are we making any recommendations to the national issue level? Like how we can cope up, how we can able to improve that one? So I think one of the things that's being recommended, so looking at agency workers, so one of the things that's being recommended is that people won't be able to, is that people shouldn't be able to become agency workers unless they're at least five years post-qualified. They're looking at having specialist social work roles around child protection, um, making sure that the terms and conditions around agency work, for example, is the same wherever you are. So, you know, so if you're working, I don't know, in... Thurrock, you don't get a certain amount, but if you go and work down the road, I don't know, in one of the London authorities, that they may be offering more um, per hour for an agency worker. So trying to stop that sort of, not bidding, but trying to stop the increases um, for agency workers and making permanent work more attractive. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Just a quick uh, question uh, about unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. Do we know of any, well, I know of one case, I don't know how true it is, but how do we know that they are actually children within our age limits from, say, eight, under 18 or up to 25? I know one foster uh, carer who was suddenly given a, a call quite late at night to take in two, two males uh, of nine and 15. She said the nine-year-old was about the right age, but the other child w must have been about 29 or 30. I wondered if there's many cases you've come across, either in Thurrock or other areas. I'm just curious to know, thank you. So when unaccompanied asylum-seeking uh, children present um, in the country. So usually we'll get a call um, and then we'll be told how old they're saying they are. So if a young person says they're 16, social worker will go out and do a visit. There'll be a, a, a basic assessment done, depending on where, if it's the police or if it's border force, um, to identify. So they'll say to us what they appear to be, what they say. Um, we will go out and um, visit and speak to the young person with an interpreter. Um, we'll ask some questions and try and get a sense from what they're saying to us whether it's what they're saying is right. 
um, and we will do what we call a brief age, a brief assessment of age. If the young person appears to be um, somewhere around the age, if they seem to be around 21 or under, and they say they're a child, and they say they're 16, for example, then we have to accept them as a child, if they say they're a child. There is something called a Merton um, age assessment, so something that is done to kind of establish whether or not a young person is a child or an adult. Um, but sometimes it's really difficult to tell because somebody can look 25. What we've got to remember is that some of these young people have traveled miles and miles and lived some difficult lives. And sometimes it's really difficult to tell if somebody's 15, 16, 17, but maybe sometimes after they've settled in a placement. So I think, you know, there has been times when young people have presented initially and they've seemed older. And as they've settled into placement and they've, you know, had a shower, they're less nervous, um, you start talking to them, then they can appear to be younger than, than you initially think. We don't have um, a large number of young people that come, that present to Thurrock where we're um, disputing their age. It's quite rare that we're disputing age. Was, um, just that 15, to say they were 15, and obviously they were like 29 or 30, it's a big age gap even if you've been traveling for days and days, if you get what I mean. Thank you, thank you. I mean, it's quite a difficult one. If we thought somebody was an adult, if we thought, thought somebody was significantly older than they were saying, A, we would be really careful about where we place them, so we wouldn't want to place them with children, for example. And if we really didn't believe that they were under, if they were, we thought they were significantly older than they were presenting as, then we would dispute that and we would say that we assess them as an adult. So, uh, assess them as an adult, you mean you perhaps get a dentist in to, to look at their teeth, because you can go by age from the teeth, can't you? <laughs> oh, no. That's not how we assess, so we don't assess using teeth or anything like that. Um, it is based on presentation, the answers they give, how consistent they are, those sorts of things. Thank you. Sorry, Jana. Um, I just wanted to check. You said um, I couldn't quite hear what you said because there was a bit of chatter at the back. Um, but you said, did you say 50 agency workers currently, social workers, qualified social workers? And were you able to give a figure for how many social workers in total we've got, we employ? Or was that the bit that you had to come back on? I need to come back. I need to be sure. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Um, may I just pick up something for Cheryl, if that's okay? Um, when you were talking to Councillor Muldoney about the apprenticeship issue, um, it seemed that you were talking it was more of an issue on the employer rather than the um, care leaver side. Um, as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong, there aren't actually any different incentives to employers regarding care leavers as opposed to any young people. Is there anything, I know it would be more a government national issue, but is there anything that's been looked at to try and encourage employers maybe to look at care leavers? Because I think it's probably something that most employers aren't even thinking of or aware of. Um, it, I don't know if there are any uh, you know, things in place to look into that. Or yeah, I mean, one of the things we do with employers is try and support all our vulnerable groups. So it might be care leavers, it might be young people with special educational needs, it might be a young person that's been through the um, criminal justice system. So we're always trying to work with employers to say, is there ways in which you could support someone that needs additional support? so they'll, they'll need more help. What we try and do, if that is the case, we work closely with the employer and, you know, we offer some support from Inspire. So we've got some young people on what's called supported internships at the moment. So we're constantly co uh, sort of contacting them. How are they doing? What's happened? Because sometimes we can pick things up really quickly and, and stop it from falling. So, you know, we're doing that, um, you know, at a number of different levels. I think specifically around um, care leavers, there isn't anything currently 
that is just specific um, for care leavers, but it is something that I think is probably something worth raising and giving some more consideration to, as we would also do for special educational needs, those coming out of the youth criminal justice system. There's a whole range of vulnerable young people that it would be good to see if we could offer an, any additional support for. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there's no further questions, um, thank you very much, Janice, for your report. Thank you. Um, so we now move to the recommendations on page 28. Is it 28? Um, I don't think it is 28, is it? Uh, 25. I don't know. Where are they? 26, they are, is that right? So we've got recommendation 1.1, that members review the areas of improvement and areas requiring further development as well as challenges in children's social care. Okay, that's good. Uh, recommendation 1.2, that members note the work undertaken to date to manage demand for statutory social care services. Thank good, you. lovely, thank you. So we will now move um, to item 10 which is the statutory duties report to education and may I ask Michelle Lucas to introduce the report. Yeah, good evening colleagues. Um, I just want to start um, with an apology actually. As, um, I'd like the committee to consider uh, removing um, the recommendation 1.2 because it talks about the operating model and clearly that's not within the paper. So I'd like to suggest to committee if they're okay with that, that we remove that recommendation. Is that okay with members? Yeah, 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 that's fine. Yes, thank you, that's fine. Oh, thank you very much. So um, this report sets out the statutory duties for education. Um, I won't go through them all. Um, clearly, we've got a number of duties around early years. Um, in fact, committee have, um, in the last municipal year, had quite a focus on early years, particularly around recruitment and how we could support recruitment. That is a key challenge for our early years providers. Um, our early years section is all funded from something called the Designated Schools Grant. So that's external money that comes in from government and it's part of the funding stream to support local authorities in supporting that early years space. So it is fully funded uh, by the DSG. Um, we've got very little now around um, the school effectiveness because clearly uh, the majority of our schools are now academies. Um, we still have some duties that we follow through. What we do do with our schools is we do something called an annual conversation where we go and visit our schools to just talk through their uh, school improvement plans, uh, what some of the challenges they've got, uh, what we can do to support them um, sort of going forward. So that picks up the school effectiveness um, sort of work. Um, one of the key drivers currently for the Department of Education is school attendance. Clearly there are, and I'm sure um, members will have seen reported in the press, there are a number of children who have struggled to return to school after um, COVID. So there is a big emphasis uh, from the Department of Education around school attendance. So within our school attendance and support team, we do termly meetings with all of our schools. We look at attendance, we look at some casework. So if there are some children there that are really struggling around attendance, we look to see what we can do um, to support that. And where if the attendance is, is very, very low, then clearly we're involving our colleagues from social care to look at what else is going on in the family. What's making it so difficult for that child to actually get to school? So there is a real big drive at the minute around school attendance um, and support. Um, one of our statutory duties is our virtual school, which of course is, is looking at all of our looked after children, making sure that they've got a really strong offer, um, you know, that they've got really good places um, to learn. Um, moving on, uh, we then go into the world of special educational needs, um, our educational psychology service, um, a bit like some of what Janet was talking about earlier, um, recruitment for educational psychologists is a real challenge. We currently have um, a number of vacancies. We're trying to look at different ways in which we can recruit. It's very challenging because other local authorities have been offering things like market supplements because 
it is so difficult currently to recruit to educational psychologists. And of course, that's really important because they carry out the statutory report that enables us to develop and work on the educational healthcare plan. So all of that follows through. So it's really important that we've got um, colleagues that can go out and do those assessments. Moving on to SCND, that remains um, an area that still sees significant increase. I think we reported to committee, um, probably just as we was coming out of COVID, that we expected to see a significant increase in requests for educational healthcare plans, because actually what we recognised, particularly at the early year stage, um, you know, all of those early language development, the play groups, the play schools, even going out and being in the park where you're meeting other sort of like, you know, young parents and coming together has had a real impact on that. Now, the key here is, is there a special educational need or is it just some language delay? So we've utilised uh, some of the expertise in our early years team to go out and do some work around early language development, early skills. I'm delighted to say that the new family hubs are providing more resource for us to do more of that. So we're hoping that that's going to see some difference in the requests coming through um, for plans, but it still remains um, a key challenge for us. The other area um, within our statutory duties is uh, admissions. So the local authority has a statutory duty to ensure that all children and young people have a school place. So we have to ensure there's a school place for all of our children and young people. Um, those that have been on the committee before will know that we bring the pupil place plan, uh, normally around the autumn um, term, which really outlines where we need to put additional capacity, where we're seeing things like housing development, and where we need to ensure that we've got those places. Um, I have to say, uh, it's one of the complex areas in, in the education landscape, because in some respects, you're trying to future-proof to make sure that we've got enough places for things that are going to be coming in the future. So it remains one of those areas that's, uh, that's complex pupil place planning. Um, just moving on quickly, we've got um, the schools forum. That's where all the designated schools grants is discussed and worked through with all of our schools. Um, and of course, the other one is home to school transport. So we have a duty to ensure that we are providing travel assistance to um, a whole range of children, particularly those with special educational needs. But there's also some, some work that's done around if children have to travel an unsafe route. So again, another one of our statutory duties. Um, around post 16, we have to report to the department about children not in education, employment or training, uh, we have to know where all of our young people are um, and we have to do regular reports um, up to the department um, in relation to that. And I think, colleagues, I'll probably leave it there um, and invite um, any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Um, it's, very, it's very good to see a lot of the work going on, particularly around the school attendance. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about the, um, the costing of the, the transport. I know it's a statutory requirement and it also links in with attendance. I suppose it's a sort of double-edged thing. Um, are you looking at ways to try and reduce those costing through alternative ways or is it something that's uh, like a fixed cost, something that really can't be reduced now? Um, we're always looking at ways in which we can reduce cost. We recognise that it is a budget that overspends. Um, we're looking at ways in which we can do that. We're working with a range of partners to see if they can support us with that. Um, I think it's this, it, it's the understanding of its travel assistance. Now, that could mean that we offer a parent's mileage if they're able to take their child or if they've got a relative that could take their child. We could offer a personal budget. Again, if they've got ways that they can um, source the transport for themselves. So... And where possible, we're keen to explore young people travelling independently. And I've got a nice example of that. We've done some, some, some uh, work with um, actually Olive Academy, which is our alternative provision provider. And what we looked at was a number of those children were travelling every day by taxi and being dropped off. 
We did some work with them. I'm pleased to say that now a number of them have got bus passes or train passes. Um, we're monitoring it closely because, of course, it is an alternative provision provider. So we want to make sure that attendance stays up. It comes back to what I said before about key around attendance. But I have to say, young people have really responded well to that. It's given them that responsibility, you know, as they've got their train ticket or they've got their bus pass and we've seen a reduced cost there. So we will continue to explore ways in which we can uh, reduce costs. But it is our statutory duty and, you know, we have to make sure that we're providing that. Thank you. If members have any questions to uh, Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. I've been contacted by a concerned parent at Warren Primary School in Chafford 100 that they currently don't have a speech therapist. I believe it is there being advertised, but in that interim, will there be some sort of therapist going in on, in, on until that time? And how long is that period to get one? Thank you. Um, I have to say, um, a bit like educational psychologists, speech therapists are really, really difficult to recruit to at the moment. That's the health, that's, so that's our health colleagues that are working on that. Um, it's, it is an issue, they recognise that. They're trying to get people trained so that they can get people in to deliver the speech therapy. Um, Again, what we've tried to do with the early years sector is use our early years staff, but they're not qualified to be able to do that speech therapy. So I'm sorry, councillor, I wouldn't have an answer for you tonight because it's not just a local problem, it's a national problem. And that's, they're derived from health. So, you know, I can certainly um, come back to committee at a future day if you'd like to have more information about health, but it's a, that's a health commission service. Um, so with that, with the existing staff, would you be? Is there an opportunity for them to be trained to further training to get that qualification? Um, it's quite a lengthy process. Speech therapy is a very specialist area. What we can do, and one of the things we are trying to do, is is to work at that earlier intervention stage, so that you know, as I said, if someone needs specialist th speech therapy. That's going to take a fair while. However, what we are trying to do is look at what we can do at that early language development. Comes back to some of the discussion I had about what we're doing with our early years team, working closely with our family hubs now, which is which is which is a really great opportunity to be able to engage in that. But I recognise, um, you know, schools contact me very regularly to say we haven't had, uh, you know, uh, speech and language in but it is a real challenge for our health colleagues at the moment. Maybe offline, can we have a further chat about that, if, if that's okay? More than happy to do that, Councillor Green. Please contact me. we Will do, thank you. Councillor Mull. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Michelle, for the report. Um, it's really good, actually. It is, it is really useful, I think, to for for the committee. I certainly found it useful, but I think for the committee, a new committee, to actually see what the statutory areas are. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. And the uh, appendices, which sort of go into more detail of why and where, where the legislation is. So um, very appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm... I've got, I've got, I'm, I've got a concern about home to school transport. I must admit, at the moment, um, out of all the areas, um, you'll be aware that I sent through an inquiry to you today about um, a young man who's had his home to school transport rejected, although uh, an attendee at Treetops. Um, that has had home to school transport for two years, but it's been refused. Um, so, um, in that refusal letter, which I have seen, it said that there was no mobility n issues noted in the EHCP, but the information that I've been given is that there, there are some considerable mobility and actual visual impairment issues, um, which really makes me wonder about the decision. The other thing that I noted from the refusal letter is that there is no statement in there about how the um, parent can go to appeal. Um, I do note in the minutes from last year that 
that you did say that there's a clear process, clear criteria, um, and obviously there's a duty to provide it if, if people are eligible, um, and that there's a very clear process for appeals. So what I would say arising out of that sort of in, in strategic terms is that there really needs to be information about the appeals process provided to parents in the refusal letter. Um, and obviously I'll wait your response to that offline, to that particular example, but yeah. I just wanted to use it as an example. Um, I know in the past you have reassured us that anybody who is eligible and needs home to school transport will be given it. Um, and that parents actually want their children to be more independent and travel independently. And I'm, I'm sure that is the case in a lot of cases. However, probably the cases that come to me, that is not the case. <laughs> They're not happy about having the home school transport taken away um, and um, other things put in place. So can you offer me some comfort because obviously there's more cuts to come there's cuts that have happened um are you able to tell us how many children have lost home to school transport because of the cuts that have already been implemented and as i understood it there was a policy review of the policy has that been completed and are these new refusals based on a new policy because i hadn't seen that that had come through mm. scrutiny no, absolutely. So they're based on the current policy. Um, we are doing a review on the policy. Um, what I can say very clearly is if a child or a young person meets the statutory um, you know, duties on the local authority for home to school transport, um, we've not made any, any cuts to home to school transport. What we are doing is working through on the policy. Now, the thing that I'm really clear about is, and, and that's and thank you for that. We'll go back and check the letter. I think that's a really fair point. I think there is a discretionary way in which, you know, parents can provide more information because what can happen is, so, so a number of different things can happen. Um, you know, we will look at it as eligibility. Some, so a, a clear example of that is, um, and we've certainly had some of these with treetops, once you are into secondary in treetops, the statutory duty for distance changes. So once you'll hit secondary, the statutory duty is three miles. Now, clearly there may be some, you know, issues around mobility. Once we've got that information, then we can relook really at that. And as I said, I'll respond to you on that one. But we, I want to be really clear, we have not made any cuts to home schools transport. Actually, we can't. It's our statutory duty, so we have to provide it. What we're trying to do is provide it in a range of different ways. I recently did quite a big um, exercise with Treetops, Treetops parents, actually, about this, because I wanted to talk it through with them. And it was interesting, actually, because some of them said, we would welcome a personal budget, and we would welcome mileage. That might work better for us as a family. But I also recognise, Councillor Muldowney, that there'll be some parents where that just does not work. So we have got the discretionary opportunity in place to be able to look at those on that individual basis. But to give you reassurance, there, there, will, there are no cuts to home school transport because it's our statutory duty. But we do have to make sure we're adhering to the policy, but recognise that in some instances there will be discretion that we need to look at going forward. Thank you, Michelle, for that answer, and I'll, I'll, I'll await your reply off, offline about this specific case. Thank you for that. I know you replied to me very quickly today, so I appreciate that. Um, so uh, it, it's just that obviously it's a budget which regularly overspends, and you know there's always a focus on it. So um, it is in a little box that I keep of concerns, um, and it probably won't go out of that just yet. Um, presumably, once the policy is reviewed, we will get that coming to scrutiny. Absolutely. Yeah. Policy will go through scrutiny. I think, Councillor, you'll remember the last policy that came through scrutiny because I think there was some... We were looking to put a recommendation in and, you know, committee scrutiny didn't feel that was appropriate. Went back to Cabinet and they agreed with you. So, you know, we do follow that process. It will absolutely come back to scrutiny. 
and just to check um, the point about the appeals process, if you, if you would be so kind as to review the refusal letters and make sure that, that that's made clear to parents, I think that yes. would be very useful. Thank no. you. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Councillor Lovett. Uh, thank you uh, for your report. Uh, just a quick question on uh, Constable Muldoon's question on tree drops, uh, sorry, tree top school. I have also received some queries regarding these transport issue. So can you please assure what uh, 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 is all the students, are they getting this transport or has there been any changes? So the changes might be, as I just said to Councillor Muldoni, uh, once a child goes into what is the secondary phase of their education, uh, you know, the statutes or the law changes around distance. So there may have been some changes around that. Um, clearly, we're speaking to parents around different ways in which uh, their child can get to school. Um, I, I probably, forgive me, I'll say it again, it's about travel assistance. I think that there can sometimes be a feeling that that, that equates to either a taxi or a minibus, but actually the duty on the local authority is travel assistance. Um, we're always looking at ways in which we can, um, you know, reduce our budget whilst also let me reassure again meeting our statutory duty you know um we have to transport those children if they meet that statutory duty councillor peel thank you chair um we know about the uh, harriet primary school in Avely that was supposed to be built and up and running by september and there was about 36 children that were going to go there uh, hopefully they all got put in other schools. Can you let me know that? Yeah, they absolutely did, um, Councillor Pierce. I mean, I know that's been a concern. I know there's um, a council question around that, which we will respond to. I think the thing here is that actually the delivery of that school is the responsibility of the Department of Education. Um, so, but just to reassure you that, yeah, the, the, the pupils that were due to go there we've made sure that they've got alternative offers. Are there any further questions? Okay, thank you very much again for the report, thank you. Um, so we'll now move to recommendations on page 125. Um, there's now only the first recommendation, 1.1, children's overview and scrutiny to gain an in-depth understanding of the council statutory duties across education and skills in children's services. Agreed? Cool. So item 11, which is the statutory duties report for children's social care. I may I ask Janet Simon to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. So a bit like Michelle, I'm not going to go through the whole list um, that's attached to my report. Um, so in terms of the statutory duties for children's social care, um, there are a number of statutory duties. Um, one of them is obviously to appoint an, a, a director of children's um, services, so a DCS and a lead member for children's services, um, and that they have key leadership roles um, across the council. And um, one of those is around working with other agencies and improving outcomes for children. So in terms of the local authorities' various statutory duties, they're categorised in terms of looked after children and care leavers, children with disabilities and SEND, children in need, children, child protection and safeguarding, early years, youth justice and crime and disorder in education. Um, as I said, it's the list of duties are illustrated in the list. In terms of the way um, children's social care is set out in Thorock, it's divided into the key areas of practice into four discrete areas, each with a strategic lead responsible for the key duties that have been highlighted um, earlier in the report, each reporting into the assistant director. Um, so that's child in need um, and child protection, children looked after and aftercare, safeguarding and quality assurance, and early help from prevention and youth offending service. Um, the children with disabilities sits across the children looked after and after care and early help and prevention and youth offending. This structure was introduced over a phase period um, from 2017, following a requires improvement Ofsted judgment in 2016, 
and it ensures that a robust leadership and management model was in place to support the service in delivering statutory duties. Um, obviously, as local authorities, all local authorities, um, children's social care is subject to a number of regulatory inspections and focus visits, um, which look at whether needs are being met and the outcomes for children and that statutory duties are being met in terms of children and their needs. Um, there was the Ofsted introduced the ILAX inspection, the inspection of local authority children's services uh, framework in 2018. Um, Thurrock had a full ILAX inspection in November 2019, um, which um, judged us as good in all areas. Um, the ILAX inspection is very re robust and detailed review of all areas of practice in, in children's social care right across all of the services described. Um, our youth offending service is also subject to regulatory inspections. And there was an inspection last year in May with an outcome, again, of that we were providing good services with some areas of outstanding practice. Um, so that kind of sets out what the key statutory duties are. There is a long list, um, and I suppose what I would want to assure members is that we continue to meet our statutory duties. Um, thank you very much for your thoughts on all your work that you and your team do in social care. Does anyone ha any members have any questions regarding the report? Councillor McGuinn. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, it might be useful for for all members of the committee to know are there any duties within children's services that aren't statutory <laughs> i would say not in terms of what we're delivering no thank you so the the basically everything that we do is, is is i mean it is that kind of area anyway there's there's lots of there's lots of law around um children's social care so um, Sheila, you wanted to add? It, yeah, it, I think practically all the work that we do in children's services, there is a statute that we could say relates to that work, including children in need, which quite often comes under Section 17, which is early help and support. I suppose the more tricky question is, um, what is your minimum statutory duty? So uh, if we use fam um, uh, family centres as an example, um, children's centres, there is a statutory duty to have a children's centre, but you can have one and be meeting your statutory duty, you know, instead of having four or five or six. So, so uh, I would say, you know, that, that practically all of our services have a statutory duty to them. I think where there might be debate or question would be, what does that look like as a minimum? And I think it relates to the, to the questions about SEN transport. We absolutely have a statutory, clear statutory duties in SEN transport that we have to meet, and our budgets have been regularly overspent on children's um, SEN transport. Um, it, that doesn't mean that we don't always sort of look at our policies and our procedures, but there are clear statutory duties for us, um, and that's sort of a range across the whole of children's services. Thank you. Um, Councillor. Uh, thank you uh, for your report. I think it's very positive to see even in these difficult financial situations, you know, the council has allocated a good uh, uh, amount of budget for this. Uh, at 5.1, there's a business administration cost of 755,000. Can you please explain what that is? It's page 138. So in, in children's services, there is a number, there are a number of um, business administration roles. So they can vary to um, sort of things like um, panel administrators for our fostering and adoption panels. We have to have a panel administrator for those roles. Um, it can be somebody who sits within the adoption service and makes sure that we're kind of doing our returns appropriately. Um, we have minute takers, so we for our child protection conferences, we have to have minute takers. Um, for our strategy meetings and discussions, we need minute takers. Um, we have to make sure that children have got passports and some of the basic documents, somebody to administer things like post. There are a range of posts within the service. Um, and we've 
obviously through trying to make savings and contribute to the savings that the council have made. Um, we did review all of our business support and we did make some changes in that area to make sure that we were, we were making savings. And I think last year we made a saving of around 300,000 um, on business support. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, the other question that I had is obviously there have been some cuts within children's social care. Um, there was the out of hours duty team. Um, as I understand it, these cuts have already been made. That transition has already been made. So my question was, did, did they come through scrutiny um, before they were made? Um, or was it just the vote at full council budget setting meeting? Um, were there impact assessments around those changes? Uh, and if so, um, could you say a little about, a bit about that? And can you offer us some comfort and reassurance that this hasn't reduced the capacity of the service to um, complete our statutory duties in those areas? Thank you. Okay, as a local authority, we were required to provide an out of hours service um, to our vulnerable um, residents. Um, we, when we did the first, um, looked at the first round of savings, um, the issue of out of hours services was brought to overview and scrutiny and discussed. Um, yes, we did look at sort of what the impact would be on our residents in terms of not having an out of hours dedicated duty service. Um, we do continue to provide an out of hours duty service, um, but instead of having a dedicated team to it, it, this is covered by staff who also work during the daytime on a shift rotor basis. So we have um, sessional workers who provide an out of hours service. They're all experienced social workers. They have to be a senior practitioner or above. Um, we have a senior manager on call every night who's able to take calls and support staff if necessary. The feedback we've had so far has been positive. We've had some feedback from some of our partners around the response that they're receiving from staff. Um, and that, that some of that's more responsive. Um, what's also helpful is that sometimes the staff that are on shift have some knowledge of the cases and the, that are coming through. Um, I would say that it's, it's, it's running very well. We're meeting our statutory duty. There is somebody on call every night um, and we are absolutely making sure that we're kind of meeting our statutory duty around child protection, but also um, our duties around adults as well. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's good to hear that we're meeting a statutory duty, but obviously it does mean that the work, we haven't, we haven't employed additional social workers to do those roles. It's extra that the current staff are taking on. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No, thank you. Um, may I just ask how this year's budget compares to last year's, please? Sorry, could you repeat that? The budget allocation for 2023-24, how does it um, compare with 2022-2023? So the question is, how is the budget different? Is it is it the same level of um, funding that you've got for the budget, or is the budget reduced from last year? Have there been any? I know that, that the statutory duties have to be met, so there can't be any cuts. So, so there were savings made in in the year. So the budget is less in 23-24 than it was in 22-23 as a result of savings that we made in the previous year. I think that's, I'm just thinking for children's, because this is just children's social care, yes, it doesn't include education as well, but it's at least a million, I think, that was less. However, what I would say is that we also got additional funding into our budget to take account of higher spend on placements, for example, where we were overspending um, considerably in the year before, so we got additional money to um, take account of the budget being more. Um, so, 
If there are no further questions, we'll move to recommendations on page 135. So we've got recommendation 1.1, Children's Services Overland Scrutiny Committee to be aware of this council's statutory duties in relation to children and young people. Uh, recommendation 1.2, committee to be assured that the statutory duties as set out are being met. Agreed. Yep. Thank you. Okay, um, so we'll now move to item 12, which is the work program. Um, do members have anything they'd like to add to the work program? Councillor Mulder. Thank you, Chair. Um, so going through the minutes from last meeting. Um, there was, well, there were questions raised and I know that Councillor Pierce has again raised questions about the Avely build and also, um, you know, the, the program in general. So I do understand that that is supposed to come back next year. I'm not sure if, I, I think a couple of these were on the work program. I'm not sure if that one was. Apologies if it's already there. I don't think it is though. So I'm just wondering, do we, uh, can we say when that might be able to come back? Um, I mean, absolutely, I'm just thinking when we'll have more, I would suggest, is there a November meeting, Rihanna, if it's possible, because that way we'll have had clear, um, you know, we'll have a clear update around the Avely position from the Department of Education. And I think the other one, um, Councillor uh, Muldowney, of course, is all sit Heath, um, but committee are also um, uh, updated around where we've put, had to put in additional capacity into schools. So I would, I would suggest November if people are comfortable with that. Okay, that's good. I mean, um, obviously the new school year starts in September, so, <laughs> so um, hopefully those places will be available for people then. Um, just moving forward, uh, there was an update that was promised at a future meeting on the adult education, uh, the adult community college, and there because they haven't got a venue yet or they may have a venue and and that's an update I, i'm not sure they do have a venue so it's good news yes it is very good news but again if if committee want a report brought on the adult community college we can certainly put that into the in into the timeline thank you i think it'd be good to have an update on that An update was requested on Head Start housing. Now, I think that may actually be on the work programme. Let's have a look. Uh, sorry, apologies, Councillor Muldowney. Um, the Head Start housing now sits in the uh, housing overview and scrutiny that's been transferred over into um, our housing. Um, directorate so and I act, um, oh, I'm sure the chair will have asked for a report on Head Start housing. Thank you okay that's fine. Um, I believe a report was requested on early help and oh no it was um under the stable homes built on love item the government implementation strategy and con consultation on children's social care reform i think that consultation is now closed hasn't it yeah so um councillors did ask when a full report would be brought to committee So the family hubs 
that's on the work program. Yep, um, but in terms of the stable homes built on love, we can bring that back with an update. That's not a problem. We'll do that later okay. this year. Where, when would you suggest, Janet? Um, I'd say November. Okay. Can I just suggest something with Chair's permission? Because like, you know, in March we have only one or two items. So can we just like kind of see, we don't want to fill up one meeting with so many reports and then, you know, we end up with next one, just one or two reports. So if we can kind of rationalize the reports, Chair. I don't think we have to worry about empty agendas in children's service <laughs> committee, that it never happens. I think, I think November would still be fine because we've got our two standing items and then we've only got two reports. So another two would probably be okay, but that might just be our limit for November then. Thank you. That's fine. Are there any other calls? Carter. Hey, uh, just, um, just saying I'm happy to come and uh, do a portfolio holder update uh, if, it, if it's requested by the chair or the committee. Uh, thank you. I think um, that I know there's one for in January. For the yeah, and um, that's for Barry. Uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Johnson. But um, that's uh, he, so he he holds children's. I hold education. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, I can do March if um, Councillor Abbas was saying that was a. Yeah, we could move it. We could put that down for March. Yeah, yeah. that'd be excellent. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that's thank you to everyone um, for this evening. It concludes the business for the meeting this evening and I declare the meeting closed at 9.16 p.m. <laughs>